part of the magic of Christmas is preparing for it. It's, my wife tells me I miss Christmas because all, all I do is ministry up until the day and then I'm ready to start Christmas on Christmas Day and she said, you missed the whole thing. You know, it's the expectations leading up to it, the 24-day, you know, count, the, you know, getting the, everything ready. Um, for me, I, as a spiritual guy, I'm, I'm asking God to, to be here on Christmas Eve. And, you know, one year I, I remember he told me he was going to be in the rafters. And I kept looking up, thinking, you know, am I going to see the cloud? And I, I could sense that he was up there. He told me he was up there. And I think this is important, that when you hear this, you have to choose to believe it. And, and this is what's called faith, and this is what moves God into our, our space. Um, you know, the Christmas is a problem in the sense that it, show, it comes, you go to church, you open your presents, you have your special meal, um, you, you make your phone calls to the people you love, and then it's the next day, and it's over until New Year's Eve, and then you got, you know, something else to aim at, right? And you know, then you got you go New Year's, then you go Super Bowl party, then you got Valentine's, then you go to St. Patty's Day, then you got Easter, and you know, my birthday in May. <laughs> then I don't think you have anything to celebrate. Oh, Fourth of July, and and you can almost it's I know people that live from holiday to holiday. It's interesting. We almost have one a month, just to you know, keep people with a vacation day. But but. I, I think for the Christians, something is supposed to happen at Christmas, all right? When Jesus arrives afresh in our life, it should be a reboot in your spiritual journey. And so, I, I, you know, last week I kind of prodded you. I don't want you to have just another average routine Christmas. I'd like for you to, to step into that spiritual place where God can speak to you and God can move in your heart. And God can maybe give you a new assignment, maybe somebody to reach out to, maybe a new ex- understanding of His grace. I, I, um, every Christmas I learn something. Like a couple Christmases ago, I, I learned that when Jesus is in a feeding trough in Bethlehem, that's where the lambs would be inspected for the temple sacrifices. And so they would look in the feeding troughs, put the lamb in there, and they would find Jesus was perfect because he lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. He lived the life we were supposed to live and died the death we were destined to die. But Jesus, what makes him so unique is he was perfect. And <clears throat> this year, I this last two sermons on Sunday morning, the mighty God and the everlasting Father were just so powerful for me. There was a moment at the 8 o'clock service about three quarters of the way in where uh, Jesus just, the deity of Jesus opened up before me while I was preaching. It was, it was pretty powerful. Such a radical experience. Just the awe of who he is. And, you know, for the Christmas story, <clears throat> for the first time ever, I realized the story ta- starts off with taxes are due. Never saw that before. No wonder we want Jesus to save us. And, you know, we've got the virgin and the fiancé hearing from the angel. We've got, you know, the child being born. The angels, you know, come along and tell them to run off to Egypt. And there's a lot of supernatural activity. Okay? And... um. I think it would be easy to miss God moments if we're not tuned in. I've not been in the zone and missed the obvious. I've been in the zone and missed what no, and saw what nobody else could see. You know, so I, I've been on both sides of in and out of the zone. <coughs> but um, if you're not careful, you can get stuck fighting against God and what He wants to do in your life or in your church or um, you can lock in on a perspective and God is doing something different 
This is what Joseph had to learn with righteousness. It's different when God is moving, okay? And um, so I think for you and me, uh, it's important that we listen to God. This, I was at a party, and this one guy, he pulled me aside. He goes, you know, I, I was supposed to be a, a minister, but I, I, went in, I got an engineering degree, and I became an engineer, and he started to tear up. And I said, well, you know, not everybody has what it takes to be a minister, okay? Of course, I didn't say that. I said, you know, God uses you in whatever capacity you are. You know, engineer, architect, pastor, nurse, doesn't matter what you do, teacher, any, anything that you do, you're a representative of God that he moves through to the people around you. And, and I like Joseph because Mary, his fiance, is pregnant. It wasn't him. And he decides to end the relationship quietly. Legally, he could have her stoned to death. Now, I don't think people really did that back in the day very much. I think what they would do is, you know, she would be disgraced and sent back to her family and be thought of the town slut, you know. Uh, you know but, I mean, she could have been stoned. She definitely would have been shamed. And Joseph wants to handle things with grace. And I... You wonder, why does God pick certain people? Because you can see his inclination is already towards grace, right? And and so here we have these guys, and both of them have a spiritual base. When the angel comes to Mary, she doesn't fall into pieces. She, you know, how can these things be since I'm a virgin? And then we learn about, you know, the immaculate conception that the Holy Spirit's going to move in her body. Okay? So, you know, this is Mary's somebody. And and here's the thing, that when God enters your world, things change. They're supposed to. Okay? And I think this is a problem. For a lot of us, things don't change that much. We just also are going to heaven now, too. And, you know, might clean up a couple of things that I need to clean up, or else ask forgiveness for the ones I don't. Well, you know, change. But, but when you give your life to Jesus, what really happens is the Holy Spirit enters into you and sets up shop so that you are now prompted to live with and for God. And so, you know, this is a great place to just ask, does that sound like your Christianity? Are you, are you living with and for Him? You know, I was asking God that I might bring him more glory. And somebody said, well, don't you do that through your ministry? I go, yeah, but you know what? I feel like there's too much William that can get in the way of my personal life. I I want God to get more glory out of me than he is right now. So the best way to do it is say, hey, Lord, would you orchestrate you getting more glory out of me? Ask him to do the hard work. But, you know, there's lots of supernatural stuff happening. And and I, I think that when the angel came to Joseph, that was required. He needed to have peace of mind. But, but notice that when Mary gets the visitation from the angel and she's pregnant, there's time between the moment and when Joseph has experience with this and he's upset about it and he's going to divorce Mary. And there, there's time. So real life happens. And real pain happens. An emotional breakdown happens. Then the angel comes. Says, don't be afraid to take Mary because the child in her is going to be the son of God. And I think the extra confirmation was necessary. Okay? And I think the ongoing spiritual uh, experiences were required because you can think, you know, what, a lot of times a miracle will happen and, and three or four days later I'll start to, did that really happen? Did I just make that up? Was that really something? It's easy to just start second guessing. And, you know, I'll tell you something cool. I, I went to in Jerusalem, excuse me, in Nazareth. I, was, I went to the cave 
where Mary had the Annunciation. And I was in this place, this, you know, they built a radical sanctuary over it. And I'm over here in, you know, the, the cave. It's got a fence in front of it, a gate, metal gate. And I felt something that I wasn't expecting to. I felt a little supernatural, ooh, surprised me, okay? Really did. So <clears throat> I, I think that you know, there's lots of spiritual activity happening because your Christianity is a supernatural experience where God comes into this world supernaturally and does miraculous stuff to bring you into a relationship with him. And, and so I believe that the gifts are still available to move in our lives. Whether you take advantage of that or not doesn't change whether you're going to heaven. But I think it's important for you and me to pray for healings. I think it's important for you and me to ask for more of the Holy Spirit. I think it's important for you and me to be open to the more that God wants to do. We were talking about what sign to put up next year, and, and I said, how about this, where George brought the idea, you know, um, <clears throat> same old God up to something new, <laughs> you know? You know, because he's always doing something new in our lives. So I, I think a lot of times God isn't obvious, and so you and I need to be open to God doing something new, upsetting the routine. Um, I don't know. I think of Elijah going up to the mountain of God, <coughs> and um, <clears throat> earthquake happens, tornado happens, you know, fire happens, and then the still small voice. He was able to recognize God's voice. And, you know, there's been a couple of people that I, I wanted to give a piece of my mind to, and I, the Lord said to me, hey, you know, don't mess up your Christmas season with conflict. So that, I said, fine. So I, I got my notes ready for after Christmas. <laughs> and a couple days ago, he said, so you, you, you still holding on to that? You know, I'd, I'd rather you handle it differently than the way you're going to handle it. So, you know, I have a decision to make. Do I want to move that way? Or do I want to have my way? Pretty sure it'll breed conflict. Then there'll be people talking. and You know, it's just, no. If we just stay focused on what God's doing, I think we're in a better place. Okay? And, and I think we need to train our ears to hear because I believe he said that to me. It wasn't common sense. It was an impression that he gave. So... This is what I mean by tuning in so that you can hear from God. Um, when God puts somebody on your heart, you can go, wow, I haven't thought of that person in a long time. Or you can say, oh, I wonder if God put them on my heart. Let me send a text, an email, make a phone call, or write a note. Any one of those four things is just, I'm going to move on the possibility that maybe God spoke. You're not going to believe it, Pastor, when you texted me. Well, that's because God put me, them on my mind, and boom. Okay? There's this beautiful verse, and this is the goal for you and me. In Isaiah 30, 21, your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it whenever you turn to the right or to the left. This is the goal, to be under the Spirit's guidance. I think this is a truth and a reality that's available to us. And the more you pursue it, the more you move on the promptings, the more he's going to talk to you. All right? So, <clears throat> sometimes God will correct your faulty thinking about yourself. So, yesterday I had four different people incorrectly define themselves. Four different people. And to one of them I said, you know, you say, you speak the wrong words over yourself. You don't, I know who you are, but you don't know who you are. And to another person I said, no, nah, listen, 
I overheard you talking. We hung up the phone, but you didn't hang up. And I overheard what you were saying to yourself. And you, I don't want you to say these words, speak this over yourself anymore. No. You know, a couple of other people. No, nope, wrong way to see yourself. Nope, um, that's not who you are. This is who you are. And, and, and I think one of the big battles that God wants to do and get into our life is help us to see ourselves the way he sees us. Oh, yeah, I still got some sins. I'm working on them. When you're not working on them, eh, that's usually when the, the whole journey stops and the Lord says, so what about this? And it's not that the journey stops, but this, this becomes an issue. So that person, that issue, that experience, whatever it is that causes you to have that clenching in your tummy, that's God saying, all right, let's, let's clean this up so that you don't clench anymore. Well, <clears throat> I think it's kind of weird that at Christmas time, the Holy Family had so many obstacles. You know, at least God could do is, listen, Joseph, I'm going to use your wife to bring about the Son of God. And so, <laughs> boy, this is going to be a wonderful experience, right? I wonder what chalet we're going to have the baby in. And I wonder what gifts, and I, you know, and no, 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 no. There's no room at the end. You're going to be born in a barn. Huh? This is not what I thought was going to happen. And by the way, Jesus is referred to as the son of Mary. And you always define a person by the name of their father. So we have a derogatory term that we use. Okay? These guys are outcasts, ridiculed, shamed. Okay, and um, you know they have to run for their lives at the last second, but God provides with the gifts from the wise men. God shows up at the right time, but you know I would prefer that He showed up before I had to run for my life, and He told me, "Listen, in a couple of weeks things are going to get rough, so why don't you go ahead and make your arrangements now." But that's not the way. God is an action item God. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, we all have speed bumps in the path. We take detours at times. We deal with obstacles that come in inopportune moments. We have to move to plan B. This is the human experience. But I think you have to move to plan B a little bit less when you stay in tune. Okay? So, <clears throat> sometimes people are the stumbling block. Um, I don't know about you, but if you get me at the, ri the wrong moment, I can say the wrong thing. Okay? I try and work so hard against that. I don't want to be that guy. Um, but I sometimes, you know, other people, they have a mean streak, and you kind of have to stay in the relationship with them and get over their mean, mean streak because the reason they're mean is because they probably were hurt and hurt people hurt people. Okay? It's really less about you and it's more about them having a growth area and you can be an avenue to help them grow. Romans 14.3, let us no longer criticize one another but instead decide not to put a stumbling block or a pitfall in your brother's way. This is important. Very important. So suddenly what I'm doing is I'm empowering you to have the right Christmas perspective on what God wants to do in the people's lives around you. I guess I'm requiring you to be a mature Christian. And is that such a bad thing? I don't think so. Okay? I don't think so. Um... A lot of times Christians will have a different view. I remember at my last church, they were in the Stone Age in terms of, you know, technology and stuff. And so I came along and I, I introduced a, <coughs> a contemporary service. And I put up screens in both the sanctuary and in the fellowship hall. And this one elder was, let's use that money to give it to the poor. 
How can you deny the poor? Well, we already take care of the poor. A lot. But in today's world, you have to worship with screens. If you don't, you're going to bypass the vast majority of young people. It's just the way they operate. You and me, we don't need a screen. But the new generation does. So sometimes, you know, there's a different vision that we have to work through together. And, and uh, you know, problems are going to arise in our lives and we worry about them. But that's when Jesus says, don't let worry strangle the life out of you. And I don't know how many worriers we have here, but I'm thinking if I was in Mary's situation, Mary and Joseph's, there would have been a lot of worries. I'm inclined to worry a little bit. I'm not overwhelmed by it, but, you know, I, I can be a worrier. Uh, worry can strangle your faith. It can um, strangle your emotional health. It actually has the ability to kill your body if you release enough toxins and let worry run free. Anger does the same thing. So these negative emotions are actually cutting time out of your life. I think anger is like smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for many like decades. It has that kind of negative effect on your future. So if you're an angry person, you might want to stop and say, let me put this before the Lord and, and heal up. Okay? Again, I'm coming back to Joseph and Mary. I'm sure they had questions. I'm sure they were confused. And, um, you know, I, I had a unique experience a couple Christmases ago. I said, Lord, I really want you to be in the sanctuary and I spent a lot of time asking him to be in the sanctuary for Christmas Eve, and then I realized, well, you know, Lord, actually, um, you know, in China and Africa, there's a lot of churches that are going to be persecuted to prison and death. So I guess I'd rather you be there than to be here. But I still want you here. Well, you know, Lord, those children that get enslaved by human trafficking, I think you, they could use a visit more than you showing up in the sanctuary. All right? So I prayed for them. But then I realized, you know, Lord, you, you got to show up just because the congregation's got to put up with my preaching. So, you know, you still have to show up. But here's what I want to say. Christmas means your life is supposed to be different now because God is with us. God with us is the Christian message, and your life should be different because God is with you. And I remember this one woman said, so how is my life going to be different with you in it? And, you know, the guy had to say, well, what am I going to bring to the table? How can I, you know, actually be an improvement in your life by me being part of it? And, and I think God is an improvement in your life. Um, you've got the wonderful counselor. I just want you to see that you can be guided by his wisdom. Mighty God, he can pull off the miraculous. Uh, everlasting Father, got Jesus who comes and creates eternity in your life. Okay? And the Prince of Peace, this is that inner nirvana. Doesn't matter what's going on. I'm with God, I'm following God. Is this a persecution moment? Then let me give the right testimony. Jesus will tell me the right words to use. Is this a worry moment? Okay, let me put faith into motion. Is this a care for somebody moment? Okay, let me not be selfish and put Jesus first. You can see how God with us suddenly has implications in your life. And, and God with us is the main thing. It's been said the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And I think sometimes we forget the main thing, that God is with us, and if God is for us, who can be against us? Okay? And when you grab a hold of those Bible verses and apply it to your awkward circumstance, um, suddenly you see it differently. Your outcome is different. 
It's almost as if your faith in him changes the outcome of your experience. Well, Joseph, he's now going to be in charge of raising the Son of God. Could you imagine? Angels, this is the Son of God. The Holy Spirit moved. All the prophecies about the child. I'm sure there was lots of spiritual activity. You know, how about when Jesus gets lost in Jerusalem for three days? And, yeah, I lost the Son of God. Okay. How incredible that would be. But, friends, that's Joseph. But actually, we also have Jesus born within us, which means managing our lives to accommodate his presence. Did you hear me? Jesus is born to us, and now we have to manage our lives to accommodate his presence. So a little bit, we're Joseph Juniors. I've got Jesus in my life, and how am I going to feed, cultivate, nurture Jesus in my life? Is this a priority? Do you even think about it? Because that we're supposed to. We are supposed to. Okay? And for Joseph, his, his righteousness got challenged because God's doing something outside of the box. He's not moving through proper channels. He's not having people get married and then after the marriage, the baby comes and then, no. Whoa. He's breaking all social rules. And so if you're a righteous man, you're sitting back going, wow. So this is really unique. God is not a respecter of rules. Okay? And, and <clears throat> the covenant of the law, it says that God will love us if we change our evil ways. The covenant of grace is God loves you in spite of your evil ways. So grace is a brand new message and Jesus arrives and he becomes grace and truth. Well, the happy life that Joseph and Mary had in store for their future was going to be different. Um, they're not going to get a nice little bungalow on the Galilee shore to retire to. They're going to raise the child that's going to stop evil on earth. They're going to put his goodness into motion. They're going to fight the cosmic battle. They're going to change the dynamics of poverty, of body, mind, and soul. There's just so much taking place when Jesus comes into the world. And do you know yourself to be somebody fighting the cosmic battle against evil? Because you're supposed to. Where on your calendar or in your routine is fighting the battle of evil? Is it in your giving? Is it in your conversations? Is it in your um, extracurricular activities? It's supposed to be somewhere. Okay? In your prayers? Well, how about that? At least that. There's a new normal when God is born within you. He leads you where you weren't planning on going to deposit His Word, to bring His presence, to show His love. But you're the one who ends up Better, because Jesus arrived in your life. Well, <clears throat> the shepherds, they spread the word. It's kind of amazing. These are amateurs, and they spread the word. They told people. No one's ever going to believe that. No, they, they shared. Go tell it on the mountain. Okay? And um, <clears throat> I know for you and me, it's the annual Christmas story, and we've heard it so many times that, oh, you know, see? We've grown callous. For me, almost every year, I get a brand new, fresh something. And I want you to go on that same journey with me, a brand new, fresh something. Um, we don't need to be told new ideas as much as we need to be reminded of old truths, C.S. Lewis said. And, and so, I don't know, you know, I remember us talking to this Gen X guy, and he's like, you know, you Christians, what, what's with your traditions? You sit around and you 
you sit around a tree, the dead tree, and, and you put ornaments on it, and you know, you eat candy out of your stockings, you know, and I'm like, no, that's not at all what Christmas is about. Okay? It's just not what Christmas is about. And so I got to tell him about Jesus. He didn't want to hear that part. He only wanted to put down Christians celebrating the holiday. He didn't want to hear about the truth of the holiday. And, and so, you know, it's a hard story to believe. A virgin teenager gets pregnant without a partner. Uh, uh, angels show up. There's no room for God to have his baby. Born in a stable. All this stuff is hard to believe. But when you do, you're born again. And friends, Jesus is born again this Christmas so that you could be born again. Afresh, anew. You know, you gave your life to Jesus back in 1974, okay. But hopefully, it's ongoing, fun stuff is taking place in your life. It's supposed to be. Okay? And, and, and it's very personal. You know, here's what the angel says. I bring you good news, a great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's Christ the Lord. This is a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Did you notice the emphasis on you? Okay. You know, your Savior, your King, your Christ, your gift, straight from God. Uh, we always think that God so loved the world. No, God so loved you. And when you personalize that love, suddenly it infiltrates your attitude, it moves in your body, it changes your perspectives, and the living Christ is starting to be activated because you chose to let him be born again in your life. Well, <clears throat> about to close up here. They glorified God, and, and glory is kind of a unique word. Glory used to have the definition of um, you have an opinion, then it meant moved to having a good opinion, then it morphed into ultimately estimating the true value of something. And as I said earlier, I've been worried, how do I get more glory to God out of my life? I feel like if you ask that question, things are going to change in a positive way. More God, more power is going to show up in your life. I really believe that's just, that's the promise, and that's what gets activated when you do this. Okay? The shepherds, they went back to their sheep, but I don't know if they were ever the same. I don't know if, are you going to go back and be the same person? Or are you going to pray with more power now? Are you going to believe with faith to move mountains? Are you going to let the Spirit guide you to, to people so that you know what to say? Are you going to allow God to touch others through your life? Because if you're willing to do that, He'd love to come alive inside of you. Okay? But you need to respond. You need to decide. You need to actualize this. Okay. You know, Luigi Teresio, he was found dead in, in the midst of poverty. And when they were cleaning out his place, they found 100, 246 violins. One of them was a Stradivarius. Hadn't been played in 147 years. 246 vintage violins that he collected. If he would have sold one of them, he would have had you know, all the money he needed not to live in poverty. But he kept all that music from other people experiencing. And I think sometimes we're keeping other people from experiencing Jesus because we hoard them to ourselves. I need you to do this for me, Lord. I want you to take care of that for me, Lord. Lord, I want to thank you for the way you're always kind and graceful to me. Lord, you know, you and me, we have a close friendship. Lord, and, and how often does it turn into somebody else? How often is it being released to the people around you? How often is it showing up in your conversations, in your letters? How often? You know, I think we should get to a spot where we start sending letters out to friends. Hey, you were on my mind. 
and then somehow in a very non um, abrupt way bring the bring the love of God into the letter. Okay? I think this is what has to happen. Well, <clears throat> there is, during the American Revolution, the Battle of Blue Licks was fought in, on, on a river in Kentucky. The problem with this battle was the American Revolutionary War was over. But word traveled a little bit slower. Their cell phone connection probably wasn't working. They didn't get the news, and so they're killing each other in a battle when the war was over. And, and you know, the whole purpose of Christmas, Jesus, is the light dawned on people living in the shadow of death. Okay? And we need to get the word out. We need to go tell it on the mountain. And, you know, for me... Mary pondered all these things in her heart. And I, I learned something kind of interesting. You know, ponder, it's, it's, it's deeper than wondering. You know, I wonder about that. Pondering is when you, you take it beneath the surface and you try to understand what it means and the implications of it. And I think you and I are supposed to ponder what it means to have Jesus born again in our lives. Okay, Mary took the angel's words and pondered them. And somewhere in the story, Jesus is called the Lamb of God who's going to die for the sins of the world. And she knows this. And she still launched his ministry. And when he was on the cross, she was there to see it. And she was with the people at Pentecost. Because she decided to believe what God had to say about her son, which was really his son, which is our Savior. And I think these are things worthy of pondering, if you ask me. <clears throat>